Bob Bakker's been to the zoo, and he has other ideas. The people who want to make anything sticking out of the body a cooling mechanism should watch more animals in the zoo. Things that stick out of your head or stick out of your back are nearly always used first to intimidate rivals, sexual rivals. Second, maybe as a radiator. But the main reason for moose antlers or finbacks is to intimidate your rivals. So as usual, the experts don't agree with each other. Bob seems pretty sure that sail was used for flirting. In other words, sex. But sexy as they were, dimetrodons were important for another reason. They helped bridge the gap between cold-blooded reptiles and warm-blooded mammals. This cold-blooded lizard, for instance, can't start his day without sunbathing for a few hours. He can't generate body heat on his own. On the other hand, mammals like us and these paleontologists are warm-blooded. They produce their own heat. That means whether it's sunny or not, they can always get up and go. Warm-bloodedness is like keeping your house warm by opening all the windows and turning the thermostat way up, constantly producing a lot of heat, most of which flies out the window, but you keep your house warm. The reason it's an advantage is you're ready for any sort of situation. If it suddenly gets cold, suddenly starts raining, suddenly gets dark or, or cloudy, you've got so much body heat, you can keep your body temperature high. And while the other reptiles were still charging their batteries, great grandma Dimitrodon was already out hunting for breakfast. It was kill or be killed. And with those jaws and teeth, you can definitely see why Dimitrodon survived. Dimitrodon's name actually means two kinds of teeth. The dental records of Dimetrodon are some of the best evidence linking this tough gal to later mammals like good old Tim Rowe. An interesting point of resemblance between us and Dimetrodon is the dentition, the teeth. Dimetrodon has simple incisors followed by a specialized canine and a series of teeth of different sizes that are specialized behind the canine. This feature is not something that we find very commonly distributed throughout the animal kingdom. In fact, it's really only found in one other group, in mammals. Mammals, like Dimetrodon, have a dentition that's made up of simple, specialized incisors, a canine. Of course, our canine's pretty small, but it's still a canine. And behind the canine are a series of specialized, differentiated teeth of different sizes that perform different functions than the teeth in the front of the jaw. This feature links us with Dimetrodon, like it or not. You could pick your friends, but you can't pick your relatives. And you definitely can't pick your friend's teeth. You think you're pretty funny, don't you? Well, I have some bad news for you. What? You're not. You know what? I started out as a Dimetrodon. I could turn into one in just about any second. I don't think evolution works that way. Yeah? And if you make fun of my jokes, you're going to find out the hard way. All I know is, if it took Dimetrodon 280 million years to become human, you're not growing a sail fin anytime soon. I wish I could ask Grandpa about that. I think we could use a little recap. Okay. About 350 million years ago, amphibians left the water and moved to land. And from there they evolved for the next 10 million years into reptiles. And then we come to what we here at Bonehead Detectives like to call the Big Split. That's when the early reptiles, well, split into two separate groups called the diapsids and the synapsids. The big difference between them was all in their heads. The diapsids had two holes behind each eye, like T-Rex and all our other dinosaur friends. And our acquaintances, the crocodiles. This is a crocodilian, and this is a diapsid. Here's the hole where the eyeball would set, and behind it, on either side, are two openings through which the jaw muscles can expand without squeezing the brain. So this animal closes its jaws, the muscles can expand upwards and outwards here instead of squeezing the brain. This ultimately enabled this lineage to evolve a larger brain and a more powerful bite, a smarter, better predator. Now, check out the other side of the split. The headstrong synapses had just one hole behind each eye, starting with guys like Dimetrodon and continuing all the way up the evolutionary ladder to all the mammals. <laughs> Which apparently includes Sam. Oh yeah? Well, don't forget Cousin Allie. And most importantly, Dino Sleuth Tim Rowe. This is one of our extinct relatives, and it's a synapsid. Here's the hole where the eyeball would sit, and this opening back here is the synapsid opening. This is for the jaw muscles to expand outwards. If you turn the skull over, it's a little more clear what I mean by that. Here, 
and here are where the right and left jaw muscles sit, and squeezed between them is the brain. When this animal closes its lower jaws, it would squeeze the brain if there weren't some room on the side of its head for the jaw muscles to expand outwards. Being a synapsid has to do with developing a stronger bite to pr permit larger jaw muscles to evolve, and at the same time to permit a larger brain to evolve. This is a human skull, and this skull shows to which group we belong. Here's the opening where the eyeball would sit, and behind it is a single opening. This is a synapsid. The synapsid condition allows for the jaw muscles to expand sideways here without squeezing the brain between them. This permits us to have a much larger brain without compromising the effectiveness of our bite. Thanks to the shape of their skulls, synapsids like Dimetrodon develop much stronger senses of hearing and smell. Well, it is true that proto-mammals were some of the first animals to start growing extra bones in their ears. They had what in their ears? Sounds kind of weird, I know. But thanks to synapsids, all mammals today have an inner ear with three bones. People, too. Which is a good thing. Otherwise, you'd never truly appreciate the sound stylings of the screaming boneheads. Look at how the mammal ear is all curly and colorful and bony. That reptile ear is boring and lame. So, for example, in this jaw of Dimetrodon, there's a little flange of bone here that was involved in uh, sound reception. And this flange of bone represents a significant step towards the origin of mammals. Evolution. What a trip. The proto-mammals grew in all different directions. They started looking a lot like animals we recognize today, and a lot less like Dimetrodon. As their blood heated up, so did their tempers. And the battle for survival got bloody. Dimetrodon was a cold-blooded critter, gotta understand. Its immediate descendants were the first hot bloods. They included the first head butters, animals with huge bony crests around their eyes, for whacking and thwacking each other. Nothing about that. When hot bloodedness evolves, suddenly you have a lot of energy. You, the individual critter, what are you going to use that energy for? Well, you can keep yourself warm and you can migrate, but in the breeding season, you can use that energy for whacking and thwacking and pushing and shoving and, and ramming your sexual rival right in the guts. So it actually makes a lot of sense that physical combat in courtship would evolve right after warm-bloodedness first of all. Estaminosuchus was one of the new breed of hot-blooded whacker-thwackers. No bones about it, he was ready to rumble. Ladies and gentlemen, the winner of the Permian Ugly Contest... Not so fast, Sam. You haven't seen the other finalists yet. Meet Lystrosaurus, also known as Old Flatface. All right, it's a tie. Funny looking or not, though, the proto-mammals ruled the world. But just when you think you're at the top of your game, evolution can knock you off your high horse. The big bad proto-mammals were about to come face to face with something even bigger and much badder. Dinosaurs.